Folks, there are moments in our history so profound and significant that they can become etched into our psyches to the point that those moments actually become part of who we are. And when those moments happen to involve sports history, they automatically tend to go to a very, very special place in our memory banks. And now, if those special sports memories just happen to also involve a particularly virulent city rivalry, well, then those moments can become elevated into the stuff of legend. Well, our guest today is certainly not someone who needed such a particularly iconic moment in order to define him and leave his lasting mark on professional baseball because he enjoyed a fabulous career playing 12 seasons, batting just a shade under 300 his entire major league career. And this switch hitting center fielding base stealer who chased down fly balls with the best of them would inadvertently be thrust into New York sports immortality one Saturday night in Queens back in October 1986 when his Mets had tied it up in Game 6 of the World Series against none other than the Boston Red Sox. Little roller up along first, behind the bag! It gets through Buckner! Here comes Knight and the Mets win it! Yes, this particular moment is absolutely etched into a very special place in my memory bank. So, Thomas and Aaron, the man who snatched New York victory from Boston's jaws of defeat and definitively emblazoned his spot in our remarkable New York history, whether he wants to take credit for it or not. The man who Keith Hernandez called one of baseball's all-time class acts, straight from the beautiful Palmetto State of South Carolina. He is William Hayward Wilson, but everyone knows and loves him as Mookie. Welcome in here. Hey, how you doing? Good to be here. It's excellent to have you. Um, I know that your career was special to you. And I know that it was a long and distinguished career. You were drafted by the Mets way back in 1977. And that was after the LA Dodgers tried to yeah. draft you and you turned them down. <laughs> uh, you were drafted in the second round while you were playing for the Gamecocks in the College World Series against Arizona State in yeah. Omaha, Nebraska. And I know that you gave all you had, all 12 of those major league seasons. And I know that you take great pride in that and the way that you approach the game. What a special kind of teammate and mentor you were. All real Met fans know that. And I know that you don't want to stand on any one single moment as your legacy. I know that your Christian faith largely defines and guides you and that as a Baptist minister with your guidance and light, you have been and continue to be a positive force in and out of baseball. You brought a whole lot to baseball, Mookie, along with that million-dollar smile. We had the million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mookie, like it or not, this moment you gave us, yeah. it's just one of those moments. Yeah. It's one of those timeless moments that is etched into history. It's a it's a the Giants win the pennant kind of moment. In, in fact, it's not just an incredible New York sports moment. It's been called one of the most memorable plays in baseball history. Now, I'm a Met fan by birth, so obviously for me, it was special. But but even Yankee fans embraced that play and loved it because of who it was against. And that's the beauty of New York. You know that that we coalesce in these moments. Your book took me back and it, it, it enlightened me to a lot of things. And what, what, what really comes through in, in, in revisiting those years is that what rises to the top is what you really brought to the team and to the game of baseball. And that wasn't just about baseball ability. It, it's funny. I, I think that, uh, when anyone is drafted, I, I think they have the visions of being the person that makes uh, just a huge impact on the organization, whether they um, admit that or will say that or not. And I was no different. Um, and when you, like in high school and in college, you, and you become accustomed to winning, because uh, normally, you you know, you play with some pretty good teams. And usually you're the best player on the team. And you think that that's going to last forever, that you're going to be the guy. 
And I think initially, um, pro ball was a big downer for me. I, I wasn't aware of what it took to be a professional athlete. And I think that was the biggest adjustment for me uh, was just understanding that everybody on that field and on the opposing team was that guy. <laughs> so that took a little bit of uh, adjusting and getting, getting used to. Uh, so then you have to re-evaluate yourself as an athlete and as a person. And you have to come to the conclusion that you can only be the best person that you can be and those results will be determined by other people. And I was convinced that um, I could make a difference. Um, I knew that my difference would be a small part of what the, the Mets were going to be ahead, you know, was going to eventually become. I, but, and that's really all you can do. I don't think anyone can ever, you know, um, determine what the future is going to be in sports. They can only go by moment to moment. And I learned that at an early age. It's just one day at a time. You have one day at a time. That's all you can worry about. You can't worry about tomorrow and you can't worry about yesterday because baseball is a lot of failure. And if you carry that, then you definitely it's not going to be successful. So I just wanted to concentrate on being the best person that I could be. And um, and that's the old saying, let the chips fall where they may, you know, and it served me well. And that's that's all I try to be is try to be genuine. Um, every day you saw me on the field, this is who Mookie is. You know, which answer the old question, who is a Mookie or what is Mookie? So I try to answer that every day. I went out there and that was to be the best possible Met player, best possible person that I can be the representative of both organizations and, and family. What rises to the top is what is your presence on that team? And what, what I hadn't realized at the time, or perhaps I forgot it all, yeah. all these years going yeah. by, you were really the the – the longest term met or one of yeah. them on that team. W were you there longer than anybody on that team? You were there since in the organization since 1977. Yeah. The Wallace Backman and I were drafted in the same year. The Wallace was number one pick and I was the number two pick. So um, between Wally and I, we were the two, you know, we had been with the club the longest. So Wallace Backman was right along with me as far as, you know, tenure with the Mets. Now, <laughs> that cast of characters at the time we knew <laughs> but even but looking back it's even more incredible yeah. that, that that mosaic yeah. of yeah. who was on that team you, i don't think you could write a no. more compelling novel about a baseball team when yeah. you think about those individuals mcdowell dykstra and hojo and, yeah. and, and then you mix in Doc yeah. Gooden and strawberries. Yeah. yeah. I think, and I, I have to echo what you said, that that was a very unusual group of characters. Um, they were very, they were headstrong. Um, and each person, for lack of a better term, was his own man, you know. And uh, I, I don't think that you could probably get away with a lot <laughs> today <laughs> that, that we got away with. Then, um, but the team allowed those guys to be themselves, and um, winning was a product of the guys being themselves. That they were individual characters. Um, they weren't. They weren't robots. You know, there wasn't a uh, a culture where everyone had to dress the same, talk the same, act the same, and that was good and bad in that. So the, let me make that clear: it was good and bad in that because sometimes they, I think, they went too far the other way. Um, and it wasn't, wasn't things that you would probably, you know, uh, teach kids and when it comes to be a professional athlete, but the one thing that they were, they were determined to be the best that they could be on the baseball field. And I think that's what I, I loved about those guys. Uh, we are great friends even today. And we, um, and there are a lot of things about those guys that people don't know. Um, you know, I know they wrote books about them and it's always about the bad guys won and the guys being crazy yeah all that's nice for reading but when it came down to being this people they are some of the best people i've ever been around um i i remember things we go on a road trip and i used to have my son Preston with me all the time um, my wife and i would be in a hotel and someone knock on our door. One of the guys would come to pick, pick up my son Preston and go to the music part with him. They'd take him. It was like I had 25 babysitters. I, <laughs> I didn't have to worry about it. And they took care of him um, on the baseball field, away from the baseball field. 
And that just showed me how what the guys were really all about. Yes, they had fun and they partied and they had a great time, but they were genuine people and they had a love for each other and a general respect for each other. And I think that was the biggest part that I loved about that club. And um, it was a big part of our success because we allowed everyone to be themselves and not judging anyone for who they were, what they said, how they dressed, even their, their, their activities away from ball field. I love that about it. And there wasn't a, there was a bit of that that we picked up at the time in reading through this and revisiting this. It's really one of the things I like the best about this team is that like Timmy Tuffle was a kid from Greenwich, Connecticut yeah. and a darling went to yeah. Yale. Strawberry came from a very different yeah. background. So did doc. Yeah. And you came from South Carolina yeah. in a, you know, a yeah. different kind of environment you guys all came together yeah. and all kind of respected everybody where everybody was from. Wally yeah. Backman, you know, he was a backwoods kind of guy, and, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it was all like, and at times there were little, there was friction, but it was just so beautiful. Yeah. And there's just something so special about that. And, and uh, I think, it, I think it lent to the quality of that team. Well, I think that's what people um, didn't understand really is how that, that cast of characters, could come together. And don't get me wrong, we had our misunderstandings. You know, we've had a few run-ins in the, in the clubhouse that um, that usually stayed in the clubhouse. Um, but I think the beauty of that club is that it allowed guys to be themselves, even no matter what background, the culture that they came from. And I think that guys appreciated that. You know, Ronnie was uh, just one of the most intelligent people that ever been around but you know ball players and stuff but it allowed him to like a better term let his hair down and be Ronnie and be a big kid you know maybe he wasn't able to do that at Yale I, you know I don't know um Keith Hernandez there again very very intelligent but he was a different Keith you know when he in the clubhouse on um, Gary Carter we all knew Gary Carter great late great Gary Carter he was different and a guy that wasn't well liked in other ball clubs you know and it took some getting for getting used to Gary for his personality but there again he came in and after a month or two he fit right in and that club allowed you to do that and you weren't going to be second guessed by anything you say or did you know hey you are who you are when you come to the ballpark, we got one job. That one job was to play baseball. And that's what's beautiful. It's really what New York, in many ways, has represented yeah. for hundreds of years, is yeah. this this tolerance and this diversity and this welcoming. Yes. And so it makes sense that it all kind of came together yeah. here. Okay. So it's Saturday night, October yeah. 25th, 1986. It was, it was warm for that time of year. It, it had stayed in the mid fifties straight into the night. And it was just before midnight, a waning crescent moon appeared above Shea stadium. It's the bottom of the 10th. You guys are down three to five in game six against the Red Sox. You take it from there. We're down um, two runs, um, but we've always come back. We, I think we had unbelievable record for coming back and, and winning ball games. But this was different. This we were in the World Series and we were down uh, to run, but there was still a calm about everyone because we had two of our best guys coming up to start landing. We had Keith Hernandez and Wally Bank. Okay, when those two guys made out, things changed. Um, and I don't know if people can look back at the video and and, and look at their dugout, but um, there wasn't a whole lot of cheering going on. Um, I was sitting over there right across from Davey and, and Mel Stoudemire. And um, I remember saying to myself, man, we we about to blow this thing. We got two outs. We're down two runs, you know, and Wally and Keith. And so we got, you know, middle lineup coming up. And um, when the first guy gets up, Gary gets up, he gets two quick strikes on him. So it's just a matter of, okay, let's just wait for the shoot to drop. You know, he gets a hit. Okay, no big deal. He got a hit. We're still down to run. And Gary's on first base. Right. Then Kevin Mitchell, he, get, he gets two strikes. Nothing to get excited about. He gets a hit. All right. Um, not to mention, Mitchell was already in the clubhouse. <laughs> so that's another, story. that's another story for another day. 
Bring his son. Again, two strikes. Uh, not feeling overly confident, and I'm grabbing my bat. I'm not grabbing my bat, and I'm not really running up to the on deck circle like I normally would because, you know, I'm not going to. What the chance of my getting a chance to get a hit? That's not going to happen. Did you think you weren't going to even get up? I didn't think I was going to get that far, in all honesty. I know people tell you a story about, well, we knew he was going to do this. We knew he was going to do that. No, we didn't. <laughs> all right. We were human beings. We were the mess, but we were human. And, um, this was not a time to be cheering and patting ourselves on the back. But Ray gets the hit and one run scores. There is a little things change just that quick. So now I have to really change my way of thinking. I'm um, going forward. We're about to lose this thing too. We got a chance to win. So that's how things change and be so you and which is remarkable. Um, people talk to me all the time. I don't know what was I thinking. I wasn't thinking anything. It's just like I got a hit now. I got a hit. So I I go up the bat, and believe it or not, I get two strikes on me as well. Well, um, I had one theory in baseball. You throw it, I'm gonna swing, I'm gonna swing at it. So I said, if all you can do is go up there and take your hacks, and now I'm really I'm saying this to myself: just hit, just go for it. And I didn't know how many pitches it was until maybe uh, might have been a year later. I counted the pitches. I did. I really did not know I had swung at that many pitches. The time this kind of stood still, and um, I'm really just concentrating. I didn't hear the booze. I don't know how many people was in the ballpark because I heard no one. I honestly heard no one. And I'm I'm swinging for my life, man. I if the pitcher had known who I was, he would have threw it over my head and I would have swung at it. I would have, <laughs> that's how I wrapped it that moment I was, you know. And and to be honest with you, I was cheating a little bit because I knew Bob Stanley. Um, he likes this little sinker, you know, and he throws that little sinker. And, uh, so I'm looking away and at all these pitches, I'm looking away on every pitch because I'm thinking he's going to throw a little sinker try to get me to roll over it. And when that ball came inside, because I was looking away, I don't know if that ball would have hit me if I hadn't jumped. I really don't know. I don't think that ball would have hit me. But because I was looking so far away, I panicked and I jumped. And I think it's kind of surprised the catch as well because I know Gedman, that's a ball that he normally would catch. You know, but pass ball, wild pitch, I don't care. At this point, we're not even going to argue about that point. But when that wild pitch came in, Mitch, came in and scored, I'm playing with house money now. So. Now you're tied up. Now the score is tied. Now the score is tied. So I'm not worried about getting booed. I'm not worried about having to leave town or anything right now. So <laughs> all I got to do is, is just keep swinging. And I did. I, you know, I, I'm swinging right there. And um, the pitch that I hit eventually was a good pitch for me. Middle end, down, or left hand hitter, that was my dream. And I hit it the way I'm supposed to hit it. I just rolled over it. What did you think when it left your bat, the moment it left your bat? Is this a family show? <laughs> <laughs> you say whatever you want. <laughs> I, oh, man, when that pitch, when I swung at the pitch, um, I like I said, it was a good pitch for me to hit. And when I rolled over it, Man, I said some things, man. I was, man, I I can't repeat them. I probably would never say it again. Okay, you so know. you were unhappy. You It left your bat. You thought you were grounding out. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I left that because of the, that was the pitch I've been waiting for all night, but that pitch there. And um, so now I got one thing to do. I got to run. I got to run. Not realizing we Buckner was or anything of that nature. I'm running, but the ball was hit so slow. It took forever to get down there. And when it went between his legs, the thing I said I wouldn't say again, I said it again. I just, in my mind, I'm just I'm saying, holy. You know. I know what you said. <laughs> okay. We, we adults, so we can yeah. fill in the blank right there. So so when you, you looked up, when did you first realize that ball got through Buckner? When when did you see that? 
Oh, I was halfway down the line. You know, I saw him moving over. Did you, you know? see it go through his legs, or did you see oh, it yeah. only once it was past him? No, I saw it going through his legs. It was that the, the ball was right down the line. I mean, right in my vision. I could see it. I'm running. So I'm thinking about beating him to the bag. That's that's what I'm thinking about now. You're you're gonna because he's a he's an all-star first baseman. He's a oh, veteran. Yes. This guy's gonna make this play. There's gonna be a foot oh, yeah. race between him and me. I'm gonna beat him. It goes through his legs. And what do you yeah. say? What I say. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> you you're gonna make me say it, aren't you? You're gonna make me say it. <laughs> I'm gonna beep it out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you can you can imagine. Uh, yeah. Just imagine seeing something that you know is impossible. And this was it. Because like I said, I knew I knew Buckner. I knew what he's been doing all for those how many years old? 12 plus years in the major leagues. He was a very good player, very good fielder. I mean there was no way he was going to miss that ball. My only chance would be him to the bag, which it was good because he, he was farther back than I really thought he was farther back. It was just a total, total, total shock when he missed that ball. Total shock. Anyway. What's the best thing about winning the World Series? Oh, the best thing about it is this fulfilling the anticipation and um, what we thought we were able of doing, fulfilling, uh, finishing a job that we started in 85 because we felt that we should have won it in 85, you know, and that was like redemption because we really should, we, we 84 and 85 were two of the best years of baseball I've been around. And I thought that those years, was a pre was a preview of what eighty six eventually became was us winning the World Series. Um not in that fashion. We wanted to do it with ease, but it wasn't with ease. But um I think the the finish was fitting and it was well deserved because we had really fought well and, and been through a lot. But sometimes good teams just don't win for whatever reason. Free thing freak of things happen in baseball. The best team um, I have a theory. I always say the best team always win on any given day. So you might be the best team on paper, but that day the other team was better. And Boston actually was better than us for three games. <laughs> okay, I'm with you on that. What's the best part about winning a world championship in New York? Oh, man. The fans. The, the fans. They, I think it meant more to them than it did the players. And that's hard to believe because that's what you play for all your life. But we were the Mets. We were the New York Mets who had been bottom dwellers for how many years? I, you know, since what, since 69? You know, the Mets hadn't had a lot of success in 69. Um, and well, 73, they did well, but they, just to walk through the town, I've spent a lot of time walking through the town, and there were Met fans who were almost embarrassed to see the Met fans. You know, beleaguered. I think is the word. <laughs> okay, that might be the word. Okay, the people. Say, How can you still be a Met fan? Oh yeah. Okay, you know because you know if, you know and, and, and the Yankee fans will always rub their nose in it. How many pennants? How many championships? You know how many flags we got waved all that. The Met fans were always true. I can always, they were always true. And I went to a lot of schools, a lot of malls, a lot of stores, mom and pop stores, and the fans would always come out and, and greet me as if though I had been winning championships for those many years. And to do it in that fashion and to walk the town afterwards, you have no idea what it feels like to, to walk through a crowd of people and they just start cheering when they see you walking up, you know, you know, it makes you feel it's, it's humbling. And I, um, it it's all about the fans. I, you know, we enjoy, I still enjoy it, but I still enjoy talking with the fans about 86 and we have great conversations even to this day. I'm glad you felt that and that that was communicated because yeah. 
I was one of those fans and we wanted yeah. you guys to know how much we, we loved yeah. you and appreciated you. That, that win was so special. It's never yeah. gonna, it's never gonna go away. There's something else you said in the book that really kind of rattled me. Um, mm -hmm. You coached after pl your playing career and you, you yeah. had two stints with the Mets actually. Um, you said that, that things changed in the nineties. You yeah. saw a, a, a noticeable change. Uh, it had something to do with the structure of ownership that in your day, back in the eighties and earlier, yeah. most of this ownership structure was a family owned system. And yeah. it was sort of a, more of a ma and pa kind of approach, hands-on, uh, you know, a little more personal, personal, personally involved but in the 90s you saw a lot of corporate ownership come into play and it really changed things tell me about that a little bit well it, we saw the change and I, I think that the change um players even when they leave they want to the players the guys that i played with they felt as if though they had been were being forgotten, you know, and they didn't want what they accomplished to be. They, they wanted people to understand and remember what we accomplished um, for not only the Mets organization, but for the city of New York. And, and you know, all the players felt that way. There just wasn't enough of, of the Mets past representation in the organization. And that was disturbing. Even though I was still working there, I didn't feel part of the organization. As a matter of fact, I, I think there was one term I used in my book is I called myself a hood ornament, I think. And, uh, and for people who don't understand what hood ornament is, uh, a hood ornament is that any car has a symbol on it. That symbol just lets you know the name of the car, but it has nothing to do with how the car runs. And that's what, that's what I, I thought I was. People look at me, say, well, he is a myth, but I had nothing to do with the myth's actual operation. You had said that it was clear that that personal connection with the organization was yeah. lost at, yeah. at that point. It, 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 sometime yeah. at the end or after your career and during that coaching period, one of the things you said was that with this new ownership structure where there's a lot of this corporate ownership, yeah. that the players don't actually care if they win anymore. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I mean, I read that, I understood it, but it was profound in terms of the concept of that. And, 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 and then I said to myself, Maybe that's why I don't really connect with baseball so much anymore. Pro yeah. baseball. But, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I think you can probably go to any sport and I'll probably come to the same conclusion. Uh, because players now, so um, they have other interests, a lot of other interests where um, we probably – couldn't afford to do other things that players do now. I know, and um, I mean, more power too, okay? God bless them. And I, I just don't feel that that love for the game is not displayed. And I, I, I should be the last person to, be to challenge a person's love and dedication to their profession because um, they just don't show it in a way that maybe we did. Um, you know, I, for instance, um, at the ball games, guys would be in the ball room or the locker room or the equipment room, and they're sitting down and they're talking baseball with a couple of beers. You know, um, this is just what we did. This is what they did. You know, the wives would be upset sometimes. The guy took a long car in the clubhouse, but <laughs> but they had to talk about it, um, and we held each other accountable um, for things. I mean somebody messes up in the game or something, you know, not chastising them, but, you know, we were like, hey, you know, what were you thinking in that situation? We had Keith and Gary, you know, all the players and, and you know, who were 
Keith, who was a leader, and he's probably one of the best clubhouse guys you 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 gonna ever be around. And we weren't afraid to speak to each other, and we didn't take offense to. It. We didn't get, you know, you know, we weren't offended when someone said, you know, you know, you can't do that. You know, just you know, we used to have the term every time you do something stupid, it costs me money. And we had that old say, <laughs> you know. But you know, God, you don't say that today because everybody's, you know, for that, I, I think I might be able to say this and it will be true a lot. We basically was, it was pay for performance, pretty much. That's what, that's what our era was, pay for performance. You got paid based on what you did, you know. The team's performance, yeah. right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's what, that's what it's all about. You know, you know, I, I've read stories, you know, guys say, well, I, you know, I hit 300 out. This is so much a year, but we still lost. So I can lose without that kind of stuff like that. So, but you know, it was all about, it was a team concept and you can have a great year, but if it didn't, if it didn't show in the win loss column, um, what was your value? But today it's yeah. much more weighted on individual yeah. performance. It's statistics, really. And don't get me wrong. Statistics has always been a big part of baseball. Batting average, ERAs, all of that. All that's always been a big statistic. Um, but when you get to the point where you're playing for the statistic as opposed to the, the outcome performance, um, the situation dictate, you know, how good you are. Like an um, old good pitching coach always told me one time, he said, even though it was how good is this fastball? And then they pitched court Al Jackson. He would say, well, the hitter will let you know how good the fastball is. It ain't about how hard it is, is whether he can square it up or not. They will let you know how good it is. So numbers, if you throw the ball 100 miles an hour, they say you got a good fastball. No, well, no. Not if it's 100 miles an hour going the other direction. No, it ain't that good. So, you know, it's all about, you know, the value of a 300 hitter now. It's the value of that home run you get now. You know, it's not so much as how many you hit. You know, well, it is not what it's not, but how many is not the value of. It. So I, I think that that's where it has changed a lot. And you know, I think different when we played. Uh, we didn't have. I mean, I'm I'm thinking back on that '86 team. How many 300 hitters we had on that team? I don't know. How many 300 hitters? I don't. You know, I'm, I have to look back at. I don't. Nobody cared. <laughs> no, but nobody really cared, you know. So hey, you know, it's it's just one of those things, you know. ERAs, slaves, who cares? We had we had one of the best bullpens in all baseball down there. Nobody cared about how many saved Jesse Roscoe had or Roger McDowell. Nobody cared. They came in and did their job. Everybody it. did their part, and it was about part. the team. Yes, that's what it was all about. It's about. <laughs> There's another thing that rises to the surface in in looking yeah. back on this story for me, and it's it's as important as anything. Uh, Buckner became the yeah. butt of a, just mm. an endless line yeah. of jokes, and yeah. you know, it, it, New Yorkers reveled in yeah. you know celebrating his error. Yeah. yeah, but in truth, I mean, Bill Buckner yeah. was a a, a yeah. great person and a great yeah. player yeah. you two became very good friends after yes that. yes tell me about that bill bill buckner and i um became as close as two people could come without being teammates i mean um i i just wish that every person could have gotten to know him the way i did um he was i mean we were taught to each other about baseball we talked to other about our families and we just had conversation about fishing and hunting he was a great outdoorsman um he liked the ice fish i didn't i don't call me bill about the no ice fish i'm not going out there no ice for nobody but but that thing, <laughs> you know he would call me um he had he would talk with youth he would call me say uh mookie i need something to talk some youth i'm going to talk some youth there uh, at his church and stuff he said i need some bible verses can you help me out and stuff like that this is the kind of conversation that we would have. And he was just beautiful man, beautiful family. Um, we just, uh, and, and, but here's the funny thing. 
Um, after 86, I didn't talk to Bill until like 89. Never spoke to him, never saw him, never played against him again until like 89. Um, I had gotten traded to Toronto. And he was, had gone over to um, Kansas City. I don't forget how he gets there. And we we're in Kansas City and we get ready to play, um, you know, Kansas City. And um, I'm on the ground, I'm stretching, getting ready for the game. And I see Bill walking across the field. Well, I get up and I run the center field so that I don't have to meet this guy. You know, I don't. I don't want to talk. I, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want. I don't want to talk to him. So something delayed him, and I and I couldn't stay in center field forever. So I ended up coming back to the um, the left of your line. We we all were stretching. So I'm laying down on my back, pregame stretching, and Bill stands over me with a bat. And I'm saying, oh, oh, here we go. So, <laughs> what, what did you so think he was going to do with the bat? I don't know. I don't, but I, I've heard the horror stories. So who knows what's going to happen? So I'm standing, I'm laying on the ground on my back, getting ready to do my sit ups. And he says, Hey, Mookie, you want to hit me some ground ball? I say, <laughs> I look at him, I'm saying, What in the world? And and that's how our relationship started. That's how our relationship started. And from that day, um, we just, somehow we always ended up doing something together and had this one company in New York um, called Steiner Sports. And he wanted Bill and I to, to do some things together, um, you know, and we kind of didn't do it at, at the beginning, but then we eventually, Bill talked, I talked to Bill, we, we, we said, well, let's, uh, let's give it a try. So we did some private stuff. And then eventually we start going out doing TV shows, radio shows, um, theater shows, when it's Q and A's, and I got to see who this, who he really was. And um, it was someone we run against uh, someone who want to be a pain in the butt, being smart, want to say something a smart joke, you know, Bill Buck's a joke, but he was so gracious and so honest about everything. Uh, and we had this conversation talking, we go down to breakfast, we eat. He said, you know, this is very therapeutic for me. I say this for me too, Bill, because I felt real, I felt guilty that he went through all what he went through based because of what I had done. Oh, and he said, that's baseball, man. He said, that's what, baseball, that's what it is. He said, I, yeah, I'm making no excuses about it. He said, hey, I, it, it's just what it is. And he said, let's embrace it. So we end up just embracing the whole Mookie Buckner situation. And um, and he looked at me, he said, guess, he said, guess what, man? He said, because of us, I got to put two of my kids through college. He said, I made so much extra money. But I said, only you would think that, Bill. Only you, but but that's how funny he was. And he was just, I, you know, I, I really miss him as a friend. Um, and uh, and he felt, I got the impression he felt the same way. And I was so taken that they had a private service for him when he passed away. And his wife um, invited me, wanted me to come to the service. And she started to tell me how much Bill would talk about me and stuff like that. And um, it was, you know, one of those, it's just, it's just great man that I miss. That's a beautiful story. I'm glad you mentioned mm -hmm. Steiner Sports. Is my brother Pete yeah. he worked uh -huh. there with and worked with yeah. you, and that's the reason I got this okay, interview. Yeah. So thank you, Pete. And I, it was those stories that he would come back yeah. with yeah. that would just touch my heart, yeah. and everybody would hear these stories like that. And it almost reminded me of uh, Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling, how the friendship they developed mm -hmm. over the years yeah. after those two incredible bouts and all the yeah. bad feelings going back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Max Schmeling ended up paying for Joe Lewis's funeral expenses. Yeah. They were such good friends by the end of yeah. their, their lives. Yeah. And that, I love hearing that Mookie. It's just, it's beautiful. And yeah. as a Christian minister, what, what, what might be something when you look back on your career now that you might have done differently, or if you had a second chance, is there anything you might approach differently in your during your playing career? Well, I, I look back, and there is something. Uh, I you know I I say along the way, people have three things that they have to deal with. I know 
three things, major things they have to deal with. Um, that's success. You have to deal with it, knowing how to accept success and how to deal with success. And then during the course of being successful, you're going to have disappointments and you're going to have regrets. I have lots of disappointments. And I only have one regret. One regret is I didn't pay more attention to being a better hitter. Because it didn't, it didn't bother me about being a great hitter. I wanted to be the baseball, I wanted to be the base runner and the, the, the center fielder. That's what I, this is what I put all my focus on. And I look at it, I say, I could have been a better hitter. Not to get me wrong, I wasn't bad, but I could have been so much better. I didn't devote the time in the hitting that I should have. Um, that's the only regret that I have. Um, you know, I, I, I stuck my faith and it carried me through the rough times. Um, you know, my wife and I, we got married when I was in double ball and I was making 700 bucks a month. Why would I even get married? That's that just dumb on my part. But, <laughs> you know, I, but, you know, I just put her through so much and, and she stuck there. Um, that's the only regret I have. Um, everything else, I didn't compromise my value at all. Um, and you know, in baseball, you have every opportunity to do so. Um, no, no, I've had a, a really blessed life and career. So I, you know, that's it. Well, let me say you did pretty well at bat over 12 seasons. Like I yeah. said, you batted just a shade under 300, yeah. but I will add this. Yeah. Your son Preston had a major league. Oh career. yeah. Okay, now mm. he batted just a shade under what you did, yeah. but for the guy <laughs> who has, but for the guy who has probably the most significant RBI in Major League Baseball history, yeah. he's got you on the RBIs, Mookie. Yeah, big time. Yeah, he's got. Yeah, oh, he's got a lot more RBIs in ten years. He got you. Yeah, but he put in. A, he was a different player. Um. I, we talk all the time. But as a matter of fact, when I was um, coaching with the Mets and he was playing with the Marlins and whomever, um, we would have our baseball sessions at his house and we would talk base running. He was a very good base runner. He was really, he was 30 30 club, I think, 30 home run, 30 stolen bases. So he had a really good. Not as many as you, though. No, 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 no. We ain't going that far now. Listen, I got to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like I say, I'll teach you everything you know, but I'm not going to teach you everything I know. But um, he, uh, I was proud of him because he won the base running awards when he was with the Mets. Um, and he continued that on. He became one of the best defensive center fielders in the game. Um, he was just a different ball player. He had, he had more tools to work with. He was a big kid, strong. Um, and he learned to maximize that. He put in more work. And as I can say, that's one thing that I didn't do, you know, that he did. Uh, although we never talked about hitting. We never, I spoke with him the same way my father would talk to me about baseball. It was all about the approach to the old game. This squad, the approach to your game, that was it. He also had a pretty good coach from the beginning, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Well, I would like to think he had a pretty good coach. He was, yeah. But to be honest with you now, um, in his amateur career, I, I stayed away. Really? I think that that was too much to put on any kid to be in the shadows when um, a kid is trying to learn and you have a coach and then you have a dad who wants to be a coach and he's going to be conflicted between what advice to take. And be I because, believe because you were a major league player, you didn't yeah. want to put that level of pressure yes. on him. Yeah. Let, let them do their jobs. And when he had a question, then he would come to me. Then we would talk. But I would never voluntarily say, hey, you need to do this. Hey, you need to do that. No, 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 no. Because baseball is not a one size fit all. Good for you. Good for you. Mookie, I want to know about what what's going on today. Uh, you're a very busy man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I know you, you have a business <laughs> or two. And yeah. tell us tell us what's going on. Well, um, first and foremost, I, I, as you mentioned before, I'm a, um, I'm a Baptist minister. 
I don't have my own church. People ask me that. I'm in one of the associate ministers um, at my church in Columbia, South Carolina, Zion Mill Creek Baptist Church. Um, so I do that, my studies. Um, and on top of that, um, my brothers and I, we started a catering business. So we love to cook and we travel the East Coast. And so we cook barbecues and, and former dinners and we that's what we do. As a matter of fact, we, hold, we headed to Cooperstown uh, this weekend. We're gonna be up there cooking in Cooperstown. Uh, so uh, that's what that's what I do today. As a matter of fact, yesterday I was prepping a lot of <laughs> a lot of meats and stuff that we we're going to be cooking and stuff. Um, so this will keep me busy, and on top of that, being a granddad, so that kind of takes up my whole day and week. It's just busy, always doing something. Good for you. Good for you. And you'll come up to New York. Oh, I'm doing a. We are. We um. Doing New York, we're doing Cooperstown um, Legends game. Um, we're going to Brooklyn to do uh, a, a tailgate thing for them. Then we're going to City Field uh, during that same week to do a, a, a tailgate thing for their season ticket holders. And um, there are a lot of events that we don't have um, that we're still putting on the books and stuff. We're going to Syracuse. We're going to be going up there again. Um, so we got quite a few things going on. Excellent. And how do people contact you for the catering work? Uh, you can go on our website, um, Legacy Catering, LegacyCatering.net. Um, um, LegacyCatering.net. Yeah. yeah. LegacyCatering.net. That's, that's all. Thing. Um, but I do have an email that I got. It's got LegacyCatering21 at gmail.com. Uh, it's a joy. And talking baseball, I, I think that's important that people understand. Um, how we export players, um, how we survived, and how we still survive, and that baseball was more than a game to us. Mookie, we are part of the same generation, you and I. Yeah. We're only a couple of years apart. Yeah. We are the last analog generation. We are the last yeah. generation yeah. that will have grown up analog and yeah. in our adult years experienced a complete transition oh, yeah. to total technology and when this segment of society moves on yeah. no one will really remember it now I, I i that's scary i i think that you know you, the one thing about our past is um never forget your past because you your past has makes you appreciate where you are and also gives you warning of what not to repeat. Um, and I, I think that we learn from our past. Um, it's the same thing about failing. People say, well, forget about failing. No, no, ever forget about how you fail. Don't ever forget that because you're going to need that in your memory to remind you of what you did wrong and, and where you need to go. So I, I, I think it's important. And you're right. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm at loss some of this stuff we, what we're doing now. I don't know how to tell about that. Some of this stuff right here right now but i i still do things that i grew up with um and my brothers and i that's we are determined that we stay together and we do the same thing that we did when we grew up in that day with kids and i think that's why our our bond is so strong is that we want to do something that's going to keep us together even having fun our mother taught us all how to cook and we all uh that's how we actually um Named our company Legacy because this is what it's all about. It's about my parents' legacy. Um, my mother was a great cook, and she taught us all how to cook. And we want to make honor them by doing the great job of cooking. And her thing was watching people eat. She loved to watch people eat, and we've done it for years, just cooking for churches and for families, free of charge, free of charge. Really? And we decided to make it a bit. Yeah. Now we see hey, look, we get, most of us retired, so let's make a bit inside of it now. Yeah. Beautiful, Mookie. Yeah. Folks, the history of this incredible city is loaded with instances of spiritual intervention. The example set by this gentleman is a perfect illustration of that. Keith Hernandez had it right. You are definitively one of baseball's all-time class acts. Mookie, like the Mets you played for, you are amazing. I will forever cherish my 86 Mets, and I will forever thank God that you found your way from the University of South Carolina to Queens, New York. 
Your incredible spirit is forever etched, not just into baseball history, but into our New York history. And I say God bless you and your wonderful family, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, we can do this again sometime. <laughs> you tell me when, Mook. I'll be there. And I'll come down and see you in Columbia for sure. I'm easy to find. Trust me. Very okay. I look forward to that. Thank you so much, and we'll be in touch. Great Thanks, seeing Andy. you. Okay. okay. Nice work. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Island and Island Voices are available on Apple, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Links to both are also available on the homepage of our website, thepodcastisland.com. Island Voices is a production of Chance Kelly, Inc. and may not be reproduced or re-exhibited in any manner, in whole or in part, without authorization. Thank you. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe. History's cool.